your relationship with Jesus Christ supersedes all relationships if you love your wife more than you love Jesus you will do things that will offend Jesus if you love your dad or your mom more than you love Jesus you will obey them more than you obey Jesus Jesus said no 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 that can't work there ain't a father or a mother uncle aunt or cousin or son or daughter that you can hold higher esteem than me I must be your God nothing else What is a paradox? A paradox is a seemingly ridiculous, and you're going to hear it for yourself in a short while, a seemingly ridiculous or self-contradictory statement that ultimately proves to be true. The Christian life in its entirety is a paradox. All its teachings are contrary to the common reasoning of the natural mind. Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 from the message translation says this. This is God speaking. He says, I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way I work. So the first thing God wants us to understand is that unless we are willing as Christians to think the way He thinks and to work the way He works, Christianity will be impossible for the individual. But then He sinks it even deeper. He says, so the way I work surpasses the way you work. He says, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. So first he said, I don't think the way you think. I don't work the way you work. Then he says, by the way, the way I think is far superior to the way you think. He says, by the way, the way I work is far superior to the way you work. And we must accept that by faith. And if we don't, Christianity will be your most miserable walk in life. For this reason, Paul the Apostle said, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you just join church, and if you just hear the preaching and love the songs, but don't get your mind renewed, it will never work for you. Because we don't think the way God thinks. We don't work the way God works. And Paul the Apostle says you must have your mind renewed. But Jesus took it even further. Jesus said in John chapter 3, He said, you must be born again. So ridiculous was this statement. So ununderstandable was this statement to the religious heir that Nicodemus, who wasn't just a church member, he was a teacher of the law. When Jesus said to him, you must be born again. You know what Nicodemus said? Do you mean I have to go back in my mother's womb a second time to be born? Now, we all know that if Nicodemus was here with us, making a statement like that, we would laugh ourselves to death. Because we know that's not the way it works. But that just goes to show you that if the mind is not renewed to think the way God wants us to think, everything about Christianity is ridiculous. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Can I share with you some ridiculous stuff? 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, listen carefully, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, now you, you tell that to the ordinary heir, and they'll scratch their head and say, are you crazy? How will you live if you die? If you die, you die. If you live, you live. But Jesus says, even though you may die, you live. That's a paradox. It takes a renewed mind to understand what Jesus was saying. He continues. He says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Religion is not Christianity. This statement proves it. The Pharisees heard Jesus saying that if you live and believe in me, you will never die. Do you know what the Pharisees said to Jesus? Paraphrasing here. Are you crazy? Moses, the one who gave us the law, died. Abraham, our father of the faith, died. And you will tell me that if I believe in you, I will not die? Loco. It's a paradox. And if you don't get your mind renewed, everything that the Bible teaches will be crazy. A biblical paradox is often a window to the deeper mysteries of God. And so are parables. I love the parables and paradoxes that scripture teaches. Because it's like opening a door and when you open it, there are unbelievable things behind that door that you never even imagined was there. Paradoxes takes us deeper with God into a deeper understanding with God and into a deeper relationship with God and today this is just an introduction 2 Corinthians 4.18 it says while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen but hold on some people can't even see the things that can be seen. Now you're going to tell them, look at the things you can't see? It's stupid all. How can I see something that I cannot see? You tell me, don't look at that screen that I can see, but look at something behind the screen that you cannot see. Yeah. Sure. I'll do my best. Hope for the rest. But you see, to the natural mind, to the Christian who is not, or to the person who is not born again, whose mind is not renewed, they do not understand that there is a spiritual world greater and more effective than the natural world our eyes can see. And because we are sojourners, because we are just passing through this world to our eternal home, the Bible says train yourself to see the things that cannot be seen. And train yourself not to look too much on the things that can be seen. It seems ridiculous, but makes all the sense in the world when your mind has been renewed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 says, Let no one deceive himself. Let me just say, Isaac. The devil is a deceiver. And it's bad when the devil deceives you. There are many people in this world that will deceive you. And it's bad when people deceive you. But I don't think anything is worse than when you deceive yourself. The Bible says, let no one deceive himself. 
If the devil deceives you, it's bad. If people deceives you, it's bad. If your husband deceives you, if your wife deceives you, if your pastor deceives you, it's really bad. But nothing is worse than when you deceive yourself. So the Bible says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool. Everybody is running from being a fool. Now the Bible is going to tell me, become a fool? What the world is wrong with you? You go tell somebody in the world, hey, do you want to be a fool? Pow! Do you know how many people grew up in hostage and bondage in homes that when they finally are at the age where they can spring away from home, they don't want to hear anything more from dad and mom. I don't want to be a fool. I want to be able to think on my own and do things on my own. Yet the Bible tells us, if you really want to be wise, you've got to become a fool. There's such wealth behind that statement. There's such power and truth behind that statement. You see, the, the, the book of Proverbs chapter, five, chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do you know what puts us in trouble in this world? Our own understanding. Trying to live life on our own without God, that's what puts us in trouble. And so the Bible says you must become a fool. What does that mean? you got to come to the place in your life where you trust God for your decisions, for the wisdom that you need in life. That most often time will look like you're a fool in the sight of people in the world. But it's the wisest thing you can ever do. So while others are running from being a fool, Jesus says you run into the fact that you must become a fool before God. There's no better approach to serve God than to tell Him, Lord, I don't know the next step to take. You lead me and you guide me. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, verse 8 through 10 says this. But in all, this is Paul talking about himself now. He says, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Now, now, now li 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 listen to the ridiculous statements he makes. He says, as deceivers, yet true. How's that possible? If you know somebody is a deceiver, would you say they're telling you the truth? Paul says we're considered to be deceivers, yet we are true. That's a paradox. Oh, but so full of power. He continues as dying and yet alive. Paul says I'm dying, but I'm alive. Listen, if you're dying, die. And if you're alive, live. But don't say I'm dying, but I'm living. Christianity is full of paradoxes. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to take you a little bit deeper in some, into some of these truths because you need to get your mind renewed. When you start to think the way God thinks and behave the way God behaves and start to put on the nature and character of God, boy, Christianity is the best thing you can ever embrace in life. He continues... He says, as a minister of the gospel, he says, as poor, yet making many rich. Yes. True, huh? Have you ever seen the broke get somebody rich? Would you trust somebody that has one dollar to help you to make a million dollars? But, but more than likely, if someone made a million, you'd go to them and ask them, can you teach me how to make a million like your million? But you'd be a fool to go to a dollar, a dollar, a dollar near to make you a millionaire. It doesn't work that way. I mean, our five senses tell us that's the height of stupid. But yet Paul says, I'm considered as one poor, yet I make so many rich. But when you 
fold up the natural material world and you expose yourself to the spiritual world, you understand that a pastor makes so many rich spiritually, which is far better than any earthly wealth. And that's why Peter... The apostle said with the guy that was crippled at the gate called beautiful. He said silver and gold I have not. He says but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus rise and walk. And the guy jumped up. Never walked before in his life. Peter made him rich in health. So when you understand the seemingly ridiculousness of what scripture teaches. You understand the power of God's wisdom for his believers that walk with him. He continues. He says as, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. But if you have nothing, you have nothing. If you have everything, you have everything. He says I have nothing, but I possess everything. Paradox. Might have nothing that your eyes can see. But I own everything that your eyes cannot see. I have my place in heaven secure. I have my name written down. I have a relationship with the Lord. I have healing for my sick body. I have freedom from my bondage. I have my provisions met whenever I need them met. I have nothing, but yet I possess everything. Even angels are at the beck and call. And yet there are some that have everything and truly have nothing. Second Corinthians 12.10 Therefore I am content with weaknesses. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I, I mean, come on now. If you're weak, you're weak. Let, let's just say, look at the altar here with me a little bit. Let's just say, I bring before you and I present to you Mr. Muscles. And on my left, I have Mr. Bones. Not Jones, Bones. And I say to you now, look at these two guys. Which one of these guys have more strength? I can almost guarantee you, unless you're sorry for the bones. I can almost guarantee you, you would not even got your eyes on the bones. You'll look at Mr. Muscle and say, he can do the trick. But yet the Bible teaches, it's not the man with the muscles that has the strength. It's the bones that has the strength. Paradoxes. Crazy, I tell you. You know why so many Christians don't make it in the Christian faith? Because they're working opposite to what the Bible teaches. But you see, when you become weak before God, you see there can only be one God at a time, not two. When you become weak before God and you admit that you need His help and you can't without Him, God shows up strong. And that's why Paul the Apostle says, I'd rather be weak. I celebrate my weaknesses. Because when I celebrate my weakness, God's strength shows up in my life. Can I, can I give you a key to winning a soul to Christ? Not to the bar, to Christ. Never share your triumphs with people. Nobody, don't, nobody in the world that is suffering and bruised wants to hear how much you have achieved. Because it makes them feel worse. You know what people in the world want to hear? From where you were to where you are today. They want to hear how badly off you really were and what brought you to a better place. You celebrate your weakness in front of people. Not your strength. People that are suffering in the world and are helpless, that are addicted to all kinds of things. They don't want to hear about your PhDs. They want to hear about your DDDs. What does that mean? When you find, when you find out, you tell me.
They want to hear how dead you were, how defeated you were, how distressed you were. That's what they want to hear. Because everybody in this world is suffering. Don't tell them from which school you graduated because they might never attend there. Don't tell them how much money you have in the bank because they, they can't even have a dollar for tomorrow. They want to hear how broken you are because Jesus came for broken people. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44, it gets worse. Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies. That's already hard. True or false, don't answer. That's already hard to love your enemies. Who in the world wants to love their enemy? But then he turns around and says in Luke 14, he says, hate your own father and mother. Really? Oh, so love the guy that wants to take me to jail. Love the guy that raped my daughter, but hate my own dad and my mom. T take your Christianity and move on. Absurdity, ridiculous, crazy. Oh, but when you understand the truth behind it, the power behind it, why did Jesus say, love your enemies? Should I save it for uh, part two? Why did Jesus say, love your enemies? You love your enemies because if you cannot love your enemies, your heart becomes bitter, angry, hateful. You fall into bondage and into the trap of the devil. Love, when you walk in love, the devil can never grab a hold of your life. Jesus says, no matter what, love your enemies. And then he turns around and says, but I tell you, go hate your dad and your mom. Really, Lord? What did I get myself into here? Do you know, I say this respectfully, I was a Catholic for 20 years. The Lord called me out into ministry. Do you know that when I was called out in the ministry, my mom and my dad, who are now in glory, and I love them with all my heart, do you know that my dad and my mom wrote me a letter from the States to deny me? You're no longer my son. I almost said my daughter. You're no longer my son. You've done the worst crime ever. Why did Jesus say you must hate your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters? Yes, and even if you're even your own life. What's up with that? Your relationship with Jesus Christ supersedes all relationships. If you love your wife more than you love Jesus, you will do things that will offend Jesus. If you love your dad or your mom more than you love Jesus, you will obey them more than you obey Jesus. Jesus said, no, 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 no. That can't work. There ain't a father or a mother, uncle, aunt, or a cousin or son or daughter that you can hold higher esteem than me. I must be your God, nothing else. For these very simple little things that we fail to understand. Some of our Christian life does not progress. Jesus said, love your enemy, but hate your dad and your mom. Let me finish this story. I know you've heard it a million times, but a million and one won't hurt. Nine months later, my mom and my dad wrote me another letter from the States. I got it and they said, son, if you're doing it for Jesus, we endorse it. But you see, when I got that first letter, I could have crumbled. And I could have called my dad and my mom and said, dad and mom, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm getting out of this stuff because I really love you with all my heart and I don't want to offend you. But no, I loved my dad and my mom, but I could not let them take precedent over my life with Christ. Your advice from your dad and your mom may be good. But the advice from scripture is the one you hold dearest to your life. Because that's what 
really matters. Matthew 26, 50. Jesus said to Judas, who was Judas? Ooh, you guys have to come to church more often. What in the world is wrong with you? Because in everybody's life, there is a Judas. Do you know that? Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus Christ, sold them for a hundred dollars Belize. He sold them for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus there to call him a friend. But Peter, the one that defended Jesus and sliced off somebody's hair to tell him, don't touch my master. Jesus turned to him and called him Satan. Are you sure we're in the right religion? Are you sure we're following the right God? You are telling me to call my enemy friend and my friend the devil? Ooh, pastor, thank you for waking me up. That's the end of it. You won't see me no more. But there's truth behind what Jesus said. Jesus called Judas friend because at that point when he was going to the cross to die for our sins, he could not allow hate and anger and bitterness to envelop his heart. He had to keep his heart clean. Even though he was about to be betrayed, he called them friend. I hold nothing against you. On the contrary, Peter, the one who stood up for him, he turned around and said, Satan, get behind me. Peter said, huh? I I've been called this, I've been called that, I've been called the other. But the devil? Wow. By, by the man I love? Peter did not know that the devil was using him. To stop God's purposes in Jesus' life. Jesus was supposed to go to the cross. And Peter said, no, no one will touch you. I'll defend you with my life. Jesus turned around and said, devil, get behind me. You see, in today's world, especially when you have cameras and you're airing all over the world, people will charge you with all kinds of things. They'll say, I heard that pastor from Living Word Church call that person a devil. And because their mind is not renewed, they don't understand the one thing at all. Christianity is about being born again and getting your mind renewed. Without that, you'll be disinterested. It will be just another religion that is a burden in your life. Matthew 21, 31. Jesus said, crooks and whores are going to enter God's kingdom. But, but listen to Matthew 23, 33. Jesus said to the Pharisees, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Hold on here. The Pharisees were religious people. They lived by the laws of God plus a million one and more that they made up. And Jesus came to them, hey buddy, you're on your way to hell. Let me just tell you that. And then he looked at the prostitute and said, you're on your way to heaven. What? What is wrong with this guy? No wonder they wanted to kill him. You want to tell me that lady that wrecks families sleeps with other men that is not her husband is going to get to go to heaven and we that are Pharisees all day that pray Santo Espiritu we're going to go to hell? The world doesn't understand this. But religious people who do not make Jesus Christ their Savior, are on their way to hell. It doesn't matter how religiously polished they are. And I'm sure many pastors wouldn't say that for fear of dying, being shot. 
well, we rubbed down everybody that came through that door today and nobody has a gun. So that's why I'm not fearful. Why do whores and crooks get to go to heaven? Jesus said, The healthy does not need a doctor. It's the sick that needs a doctor. He says, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. When Jesus walked the earth and preached the gospel of the kingdom, it was the whores that repented before him. It was the crooks like Levi that came to him and repented before him. But the Pharisees said, we do not need you. Thank you. We have Moses and the law. And they thought they were going to heaven. And Jesus woke them up and said, you're on your way to hell. I'm smelling it. But you see, my brothers and sisters, that's the world today. There are over 3,000 religions in the world. And they all think they're on their way to heaven. I'll tell you with all my might, there is only one way to heaven and that's Jesus. It doesn't matter who else says what. The Bible says there is only one way to heaven. Paradoxes in life. Because you would walk down the streets of San Pedro and see the little drunkards out there. And you would say, I'm really sorry for them. Then you pass by some churches and you say, blessed are they. But when God looks down, he sees the opposite. Because church doesn't make you any better than you were before you walked in. It's Jesus that makes you better. You can actually bring your favorite dog and cat in here and they will listen to everything I'm saying and when they get out there, they still bite somebody. Why? Because my sermon didn't change them. They're still a dog. It's the same thing with religion. When you just come to church and you think that settles the issues, no, you go out there and you still curse people. Because you need to be born again. Are you okay? You can lean back on your chair and rest. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Get this one in your spirit. Or, or maybe I should say in your pocket. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you have an imaginative mind? Yes? I know you do. You're still thinking about somebody that hurt you two years ago. So you can imagine with me. Now let's just say you have five $20 bills in your hand. How much is that in total? What did you say? 50 $100, five $20 bill. Now, now watch this and, and think about what the screen has. Let me read fully what the screen has first. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Then the Bible also says the world of the generous. Can anybody quickly and just in a couple words define what, who's generous? Who's someone that's generous? They give and they give and they give and they give some more. The Bible says the world of the generous gets larger and larger. It says the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Now you go tell somebody that in the world. It's just the opposite. It's a paradox. The kingdom of God operates in stark contrast to the way the world operates. Five $20 bill. And I give away one. And I look at the $20 that are left in my hand. I only have 80. It's not $100 anymore. Who says that? Giving away you get more. I just lost 20. But let me try it again because maybe I made a mistake. So I take another $20 and I give it to somebody else. And I look in my hand. There's not $100 here. There's $60. Oh, that pastor. He's taking my money. He tells me that if I give, I'll get. I ain't getting a thing but broke. But, let me just give him the benefit of the doubt. I'll take one more 20 because I can't starve. And so I take another 20 and I gave it away. And now I open my hand and how much is there? $40. It takes faith. 
It takes trusting the Lord's principle that what he says is true. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Any one of us that are serious with God, loves God, obeys God, have tried God, you realize that God works miracles. But you go and you tell somebody out there that you are giving because you're going to get more. I'm sorry for you. You're going to be crucified. You know what they're going to tell you? Do you see how that pastor dressed? Have you ever been in that shape? Do you think I'm going to go there and give him money? But that same person goes to the bar every weekend with $200. And they don't mind that the bar owner is prospering, beating the hell out of his wife. But when it comes to church and God says, give and you'll get, I can't trust that pastor, I'm sorry. In my opinion, pastors are supposed to be broke and live in a chicken coop with the poop. Okay, let me not go too far. Yeah, that, that's the mentality of the world. You know, when, when they first blessed us with that wooden, wooden building over there, million and a half dollars worth of building and air condition and everything 20 years ago. I was rebuilding because we had to move it from the property and bring it here. And I had two missionaries from our own denomination that I brought over. And when they saw the size of the building, they thought, you're a Belizean pastor. You can't live in this luxury. I'm sorry. You know what you need to do? You better block off a couple portions of this building for missionaries. I said, where were the missionaries when I prayed for my building? They were nowhere to be found. Why should they sleep in a bed that I pray for? Nobody wants you to have anything. But, but the principle is different. Look at, I already showed you from the Bible, all the great men of God in Scripture that gave and lived the principles of God concerning finances became richer instead of poorer. But see, it takes a renewed mind. It takes being born again. For you to trust God's minister more than the bar owner. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Oh, by the way, let me go back here quickly. I want to say something. Because we have the mayor in here today. And I need at least us from this church to make sure that we lighten the load. Do you know how terribly hard it is to be a mayor? I'm not with him every day, but I can only imagine. Every corner he turned on the island. May I need this? May I need that? May I need the other? Mr. Mayor, I don't know how you do it. Because everybody is, gimme, 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 gimme. They even have a show on Channel 5. Gimme five. Nobody says, let me give, let me give, let me give. It's gimme, 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 gimme. If we live the principles of God, we will pray for our politicians instead of bombarding them and giving them headaches. I think, and this is just my thoughts, I think that when time for election come around, people are at their highest level and the politicians are at their lowest level. Because I don't know what I would tell the people everywhere I turn that says I need this, I need that, I need the other. If we learn that it is more blessed to give than to receive, we would let the politicians do their job and trust God. So Mr. Mayor, I don't know, maybe one day I could preach this to the island so that you don't have to sweat too much. But people need to chill out for a little bit. Our help comes from God. Amen? Matthew 5 and 6. Talking about paradoxes. Seemingly ridiculous things that Christianity teach. 
It says, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That's why I am forever hungry. I can eat before I come to church and I can eat when I'm done with church. And I can eat middle of the night and I can eat in the morning and I can eat by 10 again and I can eat by midday. I always leave space. Because the Bible says, blessed are you if you hunger. But then the same Jesus that said, blessed are you who hunger and thirst, is the same Jesus that says, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who comes to me shall never. But hold on. Jesus, you said I'm blessed if I hunger. So does that mean I don't follow you then? Because I want to be blessed. You said if I follow you, that I will never hunger. But I want to be blessed and I want to hunger. Oh, but the truths that are behind these scriptures are powerful. See, even Josiah thinks his grandpa is. He says, mom, take me into the nursery. I can't handle this anymore. Luke chapter 9 and verse 3. Jesus said to them, take nothing for your journey. Neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics apiece. Then 13 chapters later, Jesus said, He who has a money bag, bring it. If you don't have a sword, go buy one. But Jesus, you told us a few months ago, don't bring anything. Now you're telling us, bring everything. You see, there are seasons in life. Christians who do not understand that there are good times, there will be bad times. When you think that things will always only be good, you're headed for trouble. There is a time the Lord will provide for you bountifully. And there is a time the Lord will need you to trust Him. And that's why... The book of Proverbs, God takes us to something that we would call an insult. God said, go take a look at the ant, you sluggard. He says, they have no captain, they have no master. And they know how to gather in the summer to have enough for the winter. He says, go look at the ant. The ant is beneath my feet. What lesson can I learn from an ant? Well, God says you can learn a couple things. Number one, he says you should be wise enough that nobody has to tell you what to do. You're supposed to learn from my relationship with you and become wise to do what's necessary. He says, but let me teach you something else about the ants. And I have a little grievance with this. And when I get to heaven, I'll dispute it. Did you know that an ant has two stomach? Do you, do you see how tiny that ant is? It has two stomach. I only have one. When my stomach is full, it's full. And when I see something else that I want, I can't have it because there's no space. The ant has, is small, but it has two stomach. God, why would you give an ant two stomach? And me only one. I could do good with three, to be honest. But if you go learn a little bit more about the ant, do you know what you learn about the ant? Why they have to... Well, this is not the reason. But, but do you know what the ant do with two stomach? They help to provide for other ants. You and I, if we are not retrained and our minds are not renewed, if God gave us ten stomach, it would be all for us. Luke 17, 33. This is just an introduction. Luke 17, 33. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will save it. I'll just say this in the twink of an eye before they cut my YouTube program off the air. People tried to save their lives with the vaccines and they died. I didn't have any vaccine and I'm well and alive. People who took the vaccine, many of them are dying. Many of them are on dying and many of them are dead. They tried to save their life. Instead, they lost it. 
That's just an earthly example. But there are huge spiritual implications behind this scriptural statement. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 says, and I'm getting ready to close. Oh yes, he is. Tori, I can't forget that little mini video. And all the sisters that betrayed me in that video. <laughs> Have you ever seen that video? Can I see a hand if you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know what they did with me in that video? There was a song playing there and, and it says he, he's going to close. And, and my sisters were all saying, no possibility there at all at all. Well, I am going to close. I won't say how long it'll take, but I am getting ready to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Listen, because we're really wrapping this up. The unbeliever does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him. You go teach out there what I just taught you. You'll be stoned. Jesus said the unbeliever does not receive the things of God for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It says the one who is spiritual discerns all things. Unless you're born again, truly born again. What you read in the Bible will make you frustrated, miserable and disinterested. But when you've been born again, your spirit man is alive. Your spiritual eyes are open. And you're hungry for what God wants. You realize that everything scripture teaches is perfect. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 from the message translation. Everything, not something, not most things. Everything connected with the old way of life has to go. So how do you get rid of everything that is old? You have to die. And again, that might sound silly because you think I'm referring to your physical life. The Bible says everything has to go that's connected with the old way of life. It's rotten through and through. It says get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed in the mind and working it into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. You see, the Christian life is not you being you and taking on something else. The Christian life is you ceasing to exist and God now lives in you. That's not the easiest thing to do. And that's why most Christians never experience the triumphs of God because they're not willing to die that Christ may live. One of the reasons why the Christian life is a paradox is because from birth, think about the truth of this, from birth, the world trains us that life is about self. Jesus, on the other hand, teaches that life is about God and others, not self. Everything people do in the world is for them. In the Christian faith, everything we do is for others and not self. But you might say, Pastor, if all I do is for others, what about me? That's not your business. That's God's business. Listen to this. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God. That's the first and greatest commandment. Then he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Nowhere in those two scriptures do you find love yourself. It says love God and love others. Because when you do that, you're fulfilling all the laws. And then God comes in and takes care of you. The paradoxes of the Christian faith. 
And I'll close with this. Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Can I have my little worship team up here? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how fathomless His ways. My brothers and my sisters, don't settle just to warm your seat in chair. Be challenged by scripture to take on the character and nature of God. Regardless of what your father, mother, friends, co-workers say, be determined to be ruled by scripture. And then your relationship with God will take up the truest sense it can ever have in your life. Would you believe it? I close. So much for that video. Would you stand with me? My brothers and my sisters, let me close in a word of prayer. We might have people that want to leave. And right after the prayer, we're going to close in just three worship songs. Can I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes? Precious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for every ear that heard today. Those around the world and right here in this church. I believe that what you've deposited within them, Holy Spirit, will never leave from them. I believe that as time goes by in their life, you're going to refresh their memory. <clears throat> you're going to challenge them. And you're going to make your people new. And so I pray, Lord, that your word would be just saturated in their souls and that they would think about it, regurgitate it, and with your help and strength, live it. Thank you for the minds that have already been renewed. Thank you for those that are truly born again. And Lord, for those whose minds still need to be renewed who still need to have the born-again experience, I pray by your divine mercies that you would orchestrate that in their life. We give you all the thanks and all the praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said,